Prior to 2016, I lived in Palmdale, California. My sister, Honey, and my youngest daughter lived with my mother in a rented townhouse apartment in Oxnard about two hours away. Every week or two, I made the long drive to take them shopping and clean their house because they were both disabled. My mother was my heart, and my sweet sister helped raise me, so anything they needed, I was there for them. On the first floor, the kitchen was in the back with a door that opened to the backyard, then a big open space, then the living room and the front door. On the right, the bathroom and my mother's bedroom. The stairs were on the left with a half-wall railing going up to the first landing. My mom was sitting in her lift recliner on the right facing the base of the stairs. One night we were all sitting in the living room watching a show with the lights on and my daughter was upstairs in her room. We were laughing at something we saw on TV when I saw something on the stairs. It darted down the steps really fast, peeking up at me then ducked down behind the railing followed by a cold chill that entered the living room. My mother commented that it was cold and pulled her robe together. At first I thought it was my daughter playing tricks on me, but when she didn't pop up I felt concerned. I said, Mama, did you see something? Because she had full sight of anything there. And she responds, No dear, I thought I did, but there's nothing there. That's when it hit me, and instinctively I knew what it was and where it came from. I ran up the stairs and burst into my daughter's room. What did you do? She looked at me with her eyes wide. She knew exactly what I was referring to and started apologizing. I told her to tell me what she did to bring it into this house. She proceeded to tell me that when her girlfriends were there, they thought it would be fun to summon a spirit. Then they tried to reach the father of one of her friends who passed away about two years prior, but she said something else came through, and it scared them so they stopped and her friends ran home without even saying goodbye. Well, I was furious. How dare you play with something you don't understand? I told her that I knew she was just trying to help a friend, but for heaven's sake I warned her years ago to never mess around with things she didn't understand and had no control over. I was thinking that not only do I constantly have to worry about my family's health, now I have to worry about this. I asked if she at least closed the door and she just looked at me with a blank stare. Obviously she did not. She said they made a Ouija board out of paper, and when they were done, she ripped it up and threw it away. That door had to be closed. We gathered the pieces, and she called her friends. Two of them were too scared to come back, so we had to perform the closing without them, but in the back of my head, I knew that it didn't work, and it was still there hiding. At that point, there was nothing I could have done, viewing the circumstances at the time. Now fast forward to 2016... I had an opportunity waiting for me in Washington State, so I begged and pleaded for my mother and sister to go with me, but my sister Honey was fanatically scared of change, and although my mother desperately wanted to go with me, she couldn't leave my sister's side. I wish now I was more persistent. So I moved, reluctantly leaving them with my daughter and her now husband to take over their care. Within those two years, my eldest sister Honey's health severely declined and my mother shared with me eight months after I moved that she was diagnosed with stage 4 cancer. I flew and drove back and forth to be with them and every time I showed them pretty pictures of my new life and our beautiful green surroundings, asking them to return with me and every time Honey would say that she was too apprehensive to leave and said no. 2018, they both passed away. My mother from cancer and my sister from an existing illness taking a big part of my heart and my soul with them. My daughter and her husband moved out, leaving all of my mother and sister's things there. Somebody had to put their stuff in storage and of course it had to be me. Even though I was the youngest of six, I felt it was my duty. I drove there with my two grandchildren, eight and four, because at the time, there was no one available to watch them for that long of a period of time. When we arrived, the place was in shambles. Dirty dishes and moldy food lined the counters and was piled up in the sink, and it looked like soot all over the floor. Mom and Honey's personal belongings were strewn around the house, and in my mother's room, a barricade of trash piled up all the way up to her door. In the middle of the floor in the open space was a full-length mirror that I had never seen before hanging off a wooden ladder. 
I just stood there and cried. I set up a clean spot in the living room for my grandson to play on his tablet and my granddaughter wanted to help. As I was bagging things up in the kitchen, I noticed her just standing there staring into the mirror. I didn't think anything of it, but she kept standing there. Then I heard her say to me while not looking away, Nana, can we get rid of this mirror? I thought she wanted me to move it, but she was adamant that it be taken out of the house. I asked her why she looked so scared, and she told me that while she was looking in the mirror, she was standing alone. She couldn't see anything in the reflection around or behind her, just darkness all around her, and something was coming. I looked at the mirror, not at myself, and it did look very dark. Say no more. Not only did I take it outside, I smashed it into little pieces and threw it in the trash can. We decided to sleep in the living room and it took days to even come close to being done. This was the last night and we were alone. I just mopped downstairs so I locked the doors and all the windows in the whole house and we slept upstairs in the bedroom across from my daughter's old room. We hunkered down on some mattresses on the floor. I always left a light on in the hall. I'm reading a book online. My granddaughter has fallen asleep next to me and my grandson was on his tablet at the end of the bed. I was getting sleepy and my grandson started to yawn. He looked up from his tablet and his eyes got big. Then he ran to the door, shouting, Spooky! and slammed it. Running back, he quickly got under the covers and got as close to me as he could, making me feel very uneasy. I could see movement in the hall, dimming the light around and under the door, making swirling strange shapes as if someone were pacing following by surges of blackness and wisps of cold air coming from the space under the door. That night was long, and I felt on guard until I finally fell asleep, but woke up hours later and had to go to the bathroom, but I was too scared. I was waiting until daybreak, but I couldn't wait any longer. I slowly opened the door, fearing for what was waiting for me on the other side, and there was nothing, but I knew there was, as I could feel it. I tried to be as fast as I could, and I left the bathroom door open so I could hear the kids, and then I ran back, hearing a swoosh behind me. I slammed the door and laid, holding the kids until daybreak. I received a call from my sister later that morning. She couldn't understand how we had been able to stay in that house. When I asked her why, she told me that when she was there grabbing some boxes of pictures, she heard noises from my daughter's room upstairs. She said it was loud and she felt an evil presence and everything inside her told her to leave, so she did. She also told me that my son-in-law, from which I had no knowledge of at the time, was practicing black magic and summoning dark energy in that room. Late that afternoon, everything was done. The kids were in the car, and the car was packed. I just wanted to look in my mother's bedroom one last time where she used to sleep. These walls held so many memories. I felt like if I looked hard enough I would see her laying where the bed had been and in my mind telling me not to cry. As I stood in the doorway, a chill went up my spine. The hairs on the back of my neck and my arms started to raise and I could feel something closing in on me. In my ear I felt a warm breath and heard one loud run. I ran out of the house so fast not even locking the door. As we were driving off, my granddaughter asked me who that was standing in the window upstairs. I want to apologize to any one of my family members who might think I am implying that this thing was in any way my sister. My sister was unique, very funny, special, and the most loving person but she did have a very dark side and we all knew that. My sister was the eldest of six, five girls and one boy. She had a spirit friend at a young age and had quite intelligent conversations with her. My mother even asked her to ask her friend things she never would have known the answer to and it floored my mother when she gave her friends very mature responses. She told me later that she felt like her friend was there because she needed her at that time. After she grew older, her friend told her it was time for her to go. She lived through the hardest times with my mother. My mother's very abusive marriages, divorces, 
and ever-changing locations and lifestyle. In some ways, I think it made my sister feel very protective over my mother, almost borderline obsessive. And doing anything in her power to get my mother's approval, even if it hurt one of us, in some ways we believe she resented us for taking mom's attention. I think she resented my brother the most for being the only boy of the family and getting all of the praise that came with that role. It broke my mother's heart when he got married and moved away so needless to say that my sister wasn't too fond of his wife and made every attempt to distance my mother and his relationship. Then it was our second eldest sister because she was always getting into trouble for attention growing up and even into adulthood constantly stressing our mother out. And myself, because I was the baby of the family, my mother and I had a very special bond nobody could break. My sister had always been a little unstable, but there was a shift. Things just changed up at the house on Alexandria. I slept with my mother there, and I remember night after night she would sit on the edge of my mother's side of the bed, projecting negativity and expressing delusional problems for things that hadn't even happened until my mother would cry for her to stop. It could have been that something may have attached itself to her there, but I don't know. Fast forward to the end of my sister's life. My mother passed away at the age of 87 from cancer, leaving my sister feeling alone, not wanting to live anymore. She would never take her own life, but she longed to be with our mother in the afterlife so bad. She had been suffering for a long time with her own medical issues while mom was alive, but now she felt like there was nothing left to fight for, so if she just stopped her treatments, the end would come. We all tried to bring her home with us, but she just wasn't having it. She suffered from paranoia and wanted to stay in that cold, empty place. She would just sit there holding my mom's things, staring off into the distance like she was simply waiting. I was there one night, helping like many nights before when she asked me to come sit close to her. She said it was very important, so I moved closer. She told me that she was worried. She was at the end of her life and she felt like she needed my forgiveness. She said that she had done things, bad things. I told her that we have all done things we're not proud of, but she insisted that what she had done was not good and it manipulated many outcomes in my life. She looked very worried. She would not tell me what those things were, but I'm pretty sure I knew and they did have impact in my life in a negative way. She said that for many years... She had felt a dark presence clouding her thoughts. She opened her hand, spreading her fingers, and hovered her hand over the top right side of her head and said, Right there. I had always felt something around her as well, but I only told my mother about my concerns. At the end of her days, she suffered greatly. I wasn't there when she passed. I was two states away, so one of my sisters sent me a picture of her in her final days. She was propped up in her hospital bed with her eyes wider than I had ever seen them, staring up to the right above her head, right where she had said she felt that negative dark presence. This is not just a glazed stare, this looks straight up like fear. I called and asked the nurse how long she had been staring like that, and she told me that it had been so long they started using eye drops so her eyes wouldn't dry out. What was she looking at? It haunts me to this day. Now the night that she passed, it was late, so I waited until morning to tell my brother. He didn't seem surprised and asked me what time she took her last breath, and he said he had a feeling, and with that I replied, how so? He proceeded to tell me that after he turned the light out and closed his eyes, something dark rushed at him. He said it was cold and frightening. All of a sudden, her face came to his mind and it felt like her. He just knew she had passed. Man, did that ever freak me out. A few days later, my second to the eldest sister and my brother's ex-wife, they lived together, called me telling me that things crashed in their bathroom at five in the morning and the dog won't stop growling at the top corners of the room. Now I'm thinking that I am next. But nothing happened. Almost a week goes by and I'm laying in bed. My grandchildren sleep with me. My grandson looks up towards my bedroom door and says, Spooky. I didn't even want to look. I told him that it was alright and that the bed was covered in white light and were protected. I moved my hand as if I had a magic wand and was covering us like a blanket. 
He sat up and looked around and said, Oh, thank you. And went to sleep and so did I. My son and his fiance, on the other hand, did not go to sleep at all that night. Now I keep a very bright night light on in my room, so there was no explanation for this. I lived in an old farm-like house with a loft upstairs where my son has his room. The door to the stairs go into the kitchen facing my room. My son said that he and his fiancée came downstairs to the kitchen. They both looked toward my room to see if I was up, but in the doorway, they described it as a light absorbing darkness. They both stood there in disbelief, stricken with fear, trying to see in my room. It was almost as if whatever it was couldn't get in there, but was standing there just feet from my bed. It stayed there for a while, then went away. Later that month, my grandchildren and I drove down to my mother and sister's home to put all of their remaining belongings into storage, and that's when we were met with that same darkness that shook us to the core. It left me questioning life events from the past. Was it this thing that made her that way, and did it have a hand in changing the course in our lives? Or was what we saw in that house something else altogether? I hope she finds peace. I find it strange that everyone in my family in one way or another has experienced something warm and loving with my mother, a touch on the hand, a stroke on the cheek or back followed sometimes by the smell of her perfume. But no one... No one at all has been visited by my loving sister. It breaks my heart to think that we don't really know what is on the other side. Is she being held somewhere and we can't help find her? Or did she simply just move on? I hope it's the latter. Now someone brought up something that really made me think and I have to agree. He said it sounds like it lost your sister when she died and that's why it's been showing up at other family homes it was looking for a new host, but it seems none of you were in a dark enough place for it to force an attachment. When she passed, one of my sisters stayed, whispering spiritual affirmations, quietly suggesting she go into the light until she was gone. And that gave me peace. I'm a mail carrier. I know, super interesting, right? Honestly, you'd be surprised at the amount of weird stuff that happens to us. I've had people follow me while I'm delivering and try to get into my delivery vehicle to steal stuff. I've had a customer vomit on my car after she opened a parcel her husband sent her that was meant to go to his mistress. I've delivered some pretty questionable things that fell out of their flimsy packaging... I have seen people getting intimate near my more secluded boxes, and they didn't stop for me. This is the kind of stuff that typically happens to us contract carriers. For those who don't know, contract carriers are mail carriers who buy a contract for a mail route that is typically in a rural area that, from what I understand, the fancy mail jeeps cannot traverse. So we use our own vehicles to deliver the mail, and we are paid monthly based on what type of route how long the route takes on a day-to-day -day basis, and what the post office deems as fair. Technically, we are self-employed, but still have to abide by the rules of the post office, and we still have to become certified to even touch the mail. But of course, being in the areas that we are in most of the time, that kind of weird stuff I mentioned above happens all the time. Those things happened to me when I was a sub, someone who works for a contract holder, but does not own the route in any way. I was paid by the person who owns the route out of their own pocket money. Now, however, I am the somewhat disgruntled owner of a 10-year route contract for the first time. I've owned the contract for about 7 months. It's a pretty easy gig. The route itself takes about 2.5 hours to case, sort the mail for delivery, and another good 3-4 to four hours to deliver on a good day, 5-6 to six on super heavy days. I'm not looking forward to how the holidays fare on this route. Thing is, before I got the contract, I had no idea what I was bidding on. The way someone gets a contract is that they bid for it. The person bidding will give a monthly salary amount that they feel would be fair-ish for the route in question. The post office and bid holders then decide which amount is the most accurate, in their oh-so-wise opinion, 
for the route and they give it to whoever has that amount. I was lucky enough to get it, so I get pretty good pay that I technically chose for myself. All I knew of the route was that it went down into the valley. I live in a very small desert city with some very wide outlying mini communities. These outlying areas are where the majority of our office's contract routes deliver to. My route goes 25 miles out of town to a lot of small ranching properties in the closer areas and to some pretty scattered random loner properties in the farthest areas. There are a lot of hills and dirt roads where I go. It's very easy to get lost out there if you don't know where you're going. There's one area in particular that goes through a small forest nestled between a random outcropping of hills heading out onto the state highway. It's not like an evergreen forest or anything, that's just the closest definition I can give. They're not really trees so much as gigantic bushes that nestled together very closely on either side of the road. That is towards the end of the route, but it takes up a good chunk of my customer addresses. When I was training, the previous owner of the route, I'll call him Jim, gave me a rundown of the people who live on the route. There are a lot of ranch owners, of course, and they're the ones who get the most parcels. This isn't surprising to me since they're the richest people out there. We, of course, call that section the ranches. There are the elderly retirees that live at a tiny retirement community set up by the city out there. It's pretty spread out, like a teeny tiny little town of their own. That's the area with the second most amount of parcels. Lots of random buying and sometimes gifts from relatives. We call that area the retirement homes. These are the customers I talk to the most. There's the outskirters, as Jim called them. These are the people who live so far off the grid that most of the time we don't deliver packages to them. As a general rule, we are not allowed to deliver boxes to a house if it is more than three miles from the mailbox. Most of them live about five or six miles from the boxes. Their boxes are in long lines, or clusters as we call them, on the side of the road. As a courtesy to these customers, I ask them to give me their phone numbers so I can call them if they have a parcel and they meet me at the box. Most of them don't mind and I'm grateful to them, because a lot of the roads are treacherous. I once tried to be nice and deliver a box to one of them and got stuck, unable to move my car for almost four hours as I lost service. Eventually they found me and that's when they gave me their number at last. They don't get many boxes, though, in that part of the route. Then there's what Jim called the ghost town. It's not really a town per se, but more of the secluded homes like the previous area. But these guys are closer to the road and they're the ones who live in the forest I mentioned above. He called it the ghost town for a good reason. These people are either never home, as most of them are snowbirds, or the ones who are, are very creepy. And there are a few homes out there that are usually vacant, more snowbirds, that have a lot going on. For the stories I'm about to tell you, there are three homes involved. Two of them are in the ghost town. The other one takes place in the outskirts area. The last one is the worst, so I'm saving it for last. There's more, honestly, but these are by far the most interesting as far as history and the stuff that's happened. I'm telling them in order of intensity. By that, I mean I start with the tamest and move up as they get a bit more intense, whether by their history or what happens there. I'll give each house a name here since I pretty much do at work anyway. It's how I remember their addresses without really having to think about it. Real names have been changed for my customers' privacy. Number 1. The Bailey Cluster The Bailey Cluster is a grouping of homes in the ghost town that belongs to a single family with the name of Bailey. The mailboxes are all nestled together on the side of the road against some of those large bushes in the forest. Just before the mailboxes, there are four total, is a small dirt road that leads up to their property. The whole road has to be about four feet across. That's how it feels because when you're driving up, the bushes on either side will scrape the side of the car. I've gotten more than a few scratches because of them. I've asked them to trim down the bushes, but they never do, so I just gave up. When you get to the property, you're met with a large, six-foot-tall, rusted iron gate with the name Bailey fashioned out of the bent-up horseshoes and pipes welded to the top of it. As a general rule, if a gate is shut, we are never encouraged to try and open it to drive in. 
We aren't really supposed to walk in if it's shut either unless the customer has told us it's okay. For the Baileys, I get out and walk their parcels through the gate and up to the first house, which isn't far from the gate. I have to state now I've never once met these people in person. I've spoken to them on the phone and I've been on their property, but I have never once seen hide nor hair of any of them. There are a total of ten people at the address and their mail is split up as if their homes are in like a trailer park. For example, one of them gets their mail at 1111 Ghost Town Road, Mobile Number 1, Little Desert Town, State 88888, and the other will get it at Mobile Number 2, Number 3, or Number 4. There are four people in Number 1, two in Number 2, one person in Number 3, and the others are all in Number 4. Every time I bring them a parcel, I leave it at the first house. Once you walk through their gate, you have to walk uphill a bit. You can see the teal green roof of the first house peeking up over the hill as you walk, and when you get closer, it becomes apparent why the place is so unsettling. Clowns. These people love clowns. There are clown statues, paintings, mobiles, wind chimes, you name it. It has a freaking clown face on it. They even have clown dolls scattered around the place. None of them look nice. They're all threadbare and worn out from sitting in the hot desert sun all the time. I'm pretty sure animals have made homes in some of them. There are a few that are big enough to house a small family of squirrels. Now I know this isn't paranormal. Yet, I'm getting there, I promise. But you have to admit, that's more than a little odd. The first house is a simple, single-wide mobile with a bright teal green painted roof. The windows all have clown decals in them. Little clown faces that look like they're straight out of a vintage coloring book, hand-colored in everything. At one end of the place is the porch. Not too big. Juts out about six or seven feet. There's a small awning with dozens of clown wind chimes and sun catchers hanging from it, almost making a curtain out of them they're so clustered together. On the porch is a rocking chair. This thing is painted like a clown. The curve rockers are painted red, the legs that attach them to the chair are yellow with red polka dots. The seat and arms are white, and the back is white with three big red dots painted on it like puffballs on a clown's shirt. The top part of the back has a clown face on it. Put it all together, and it's a nightmare. This chair is where I'm asked to leave parcels, and I do, but I'll never forget the first time I left them there. There were four boxes for them, one for number one and the rest for number three. I called ahead of time to let them know I'd be out there in about three hours. Since they're towards the end of the route, it takes longer to get to them. I'm always told, by who I assume is the matriarch, to leave them all on that chair. I'd never been up to their property at this point. I'd been delivering about a month, but only ever had mail and small parcels that fit in the box for them. So when I went up there for the first time seeing their little clown cluster was a bit nerve-wracking. I'm terrified of clowns. I have been since I was a child, but that's a story for another time as to why. I crept up to that first house and peered around the place. It's so isolated and odd, I felt like every single clown around me was watching me. I placed the boxes on the chair in a neat little pile and settled the chair to stop it from rocking so the boxes wouldn't fall off. Once it was still, I turned and hastily tried to leave. It was the creaking that stopped me. I froze and listened, knowing full well what it was. I turned and, sure as heck, that chair was rocking. And not just a little, but enough to knock one of the boxes onto the porch. It was like someone had deliberately pulled it all the way back and thrust it forward to rock as violently as possible. I didn't hesitate, I just ran. I'm not staying after that. Another time, I had a parcel for them. I almost wrote it up out of protest, but I called and again was asked to leave it on the chair. This is the time I noticed that it felt like no one was there. I had been there a dozen times by then. I remember standing at the top of the hill by the gate just peering around me like, where is everyone? According to their mail, there are at least a few children that live there and when I was there that day, it was the middle of summer. Why weren't the kids home, playing outside? Why didn't I ever see anyone there? 
The second and third houses are a bit far away from the first house. It'll be about a five minute walk, I think, to get to them. But you can see them pretty well. Their curtains are always open, but I never see anyone inside. The fourth house is furthest away at the top of a small hill. They have a big picture window facing the gate. It too always has the curtains open, but I never see anyone there. Weirdest of all, their vehicles are always there. They never move. There are two trucks, an SUV, all relatively newish, oldest I think is a 2012, and an old station wagon. The wagon looks run down, but the others look like they're taken care of, always clean. This other time I had a parcel and noticed no one is ever around. I got curious and phoned the woman, I always do when bringing parcels. I figured I'd just tell her I was making sure someone would be back soon to get the parcel as there's a lot of theft out there. There usually is on more secluded routes, you'd be surprised how much more common it is out there than in the city. I heard a phone ringing in the first house beside me. If I'm on the porch, I can peek into the window just behind the evil rocking chair. It was close. The phone that was ringing, I mean, and I wanted to see someone pick it up. I squeezed myself behind the chair and looked in. I'd never looked inside before. More clowns, of course, and some clown-themed throws on the couch and pillows, too. On a side table, clearly visible from the window, I could see the cell phone lit up with the mail lady as the caller ID. No one answered. But when I left, she called me back. I had been gone about five minutes when she did. I told her I just wanted to be sure someone was home, and she said, Someone is always here. According to Jim, he never saw anyone there either. The third and final most interesting thing to ever happen at the Bailey Cluster was just last month. I got a very large box for them, one I needed a dolly for. I called before I even left the post office to let them know and the lady I always speak to told me she'd have her oldest son help me. I thought finally I'll get to meet one of them. This ought to be good, right? Well, I get there. It's my last package and I was free to breeze through the final 50 or so boxes I have after them. I have a total of 670 boxes on my route, by the way. I go to the back, pull out the dolly, slide the box out onto it and start dragging it up to the gate. I look around and no one to meet me, of course. The lady told me he'd be waiting for me on the porch of the first house and when he saw me, he'd come down and help. You can see the gate from the porch pretty well, but I can never really see my car from it, so I honked just in case he couldn't see me either. No one came down. I waited for about five minutes before saying, screw it, I'm taking it up. I struggled up that hill with it. I don't know what it was in that box, but I'm pretty sure it weighed like 75 pounds. The post office has a 70 pound weight limit that a lot of companies try to stretch to 75 or 80. Usually they'll go to UPS, but sometimes they slip through the cracks and come to us. I get to the first house and of course no one is there. I look around, as usual, I'm all alone with a bunch of clown dolls gaping at me. I wiggle the box up the stairs in the dolly and lean it against the railing next to the rocking chair. It's way too big to sit on it and head down to my car. That's when I hear, Thank you. From behind me. It's a man's voice. I assumed it was the son who was supposed to help me. I quickly run back up the hill and... Not only is there no one there, but the box is gone from the porch. This was in like the span of ten seconds. I wasn't even down the hill all the way. It doesn't take that long to walk back down. I looked in the window and everything and didn't see a soul. I hate going to the Bailey Cluster, and I ended up going there a lot. Number 2. The Blood House This place is the one that gives me the most creeps. While I was training, Jim told me about this place. This is another snowbird place where the people only live there between October and March. They were there when I started and they came back at the beginning of this month. Super nice couple. I really like them. But I don't have a clue why they live here. Jim told me that back in the early 90s, when he first started working at the post office... 
the guy who used to do the route before him told him the story. According to him, there was a family of five that lived there. All of them were absolutely crazy. The mom had schizophrenia and would apparently abuse the kids because of the voices. The father was no better. He was a worthless drunk who just sat by while his crazy wife hurt the kids. One night, the eldest child, who was 18 and finally fed up with how they were raised, tried to escape with his siblings. The mother, of course, tried to stop them and the kid finally snapped. He murdered his parents and painted the walls with their blood. The incident changed him, and while his siblings escaped, he stayed in the house with his parents' corpses until he ended up slitting his own throat and tried painting the floor in his own blood before succumbing to the blood loss and dying himself. They weren't found for months. The place was cleared out, torn down, and rebuilt, and the guy who built the new house was compelled to paint the house red. It's not obnoxiously red, but it's too red if that makes sense. There's no long driveway up to this place. It sits right on the road at the end of the ghost town. The end is literally a dead-end road, and they're right there at the tail end of where signs tell you to turn around. The current owners, we'll call them Mr. and Mrs. Nice, because they're nice and I'm not that creative at the moment, have told me countless horror stories about living there. Sometimes I think they get some sort of sick thrill out of it. When they're not there, I forward everything, but I have to pass their house to get to the turnaround spot and their neighbors always have mail, so I'll go by them no matter what. I've seen some really weird stuff out there, but every time I pass the blood house, I just get this awful feeling of dread. Whenever I did deliver packages to them, I step out of the car and just standing at the edge of the driveway feels like standing at the precipice of a cliff. I feel like stepping onto their property is like jumping off to my death. It's terribly unsettling. I honestly don't know how they stay there for as long as they do. I mean, they leave for six months out of the year, so I guess for them it might not be too bad. But if I feel that way just delivering packages once in a while, I don't know. It just doesn't make sense to me. Mrs. Nice told me to always watch the third window from the left because that's where the son who went mad likes to sit. She calls him Tommy, even though that wasn't his real name. She feels it suits him. She talks about him like he's her own son. I think she pities him. She believes his soul is trapped there because of all the terrible things that happened to him. When she first told me, my reaction was, no thanks. But one day, the temptation got the best of me and I looked. When you're at their mailbox, you can see into their windows. The house is a long, one-story place with six windows, three on either side of the small front door. Of course, the house is red, but the trim and door are all white. The window in question is the one that sits right next to the front door on the left. Mrs. Nice told me that's the front guest room. So, I looked, and I couldn't believe my eyes. I didn't see a full-bodied apparition or anything like that, but I definitely saw a face, and it looked so anguished. Like you know the happy and sad mask that you see for drama and theater? It looked like the sad mask, just pained. I blinked and the face was suddenly gone and the curtain, which was open, had been closed. Another time I walked up to the house to put a package by the door. The nices weren't home that day. The truck was gone, so I decided I would put the package around the back and leave a note in their box to let them know since I didn't have a number for them at the time. When I rocked around the back, I put the package over the small fence in their backyard. Once I did, I turned and I felt myself run into someone. But there wasn't anything in front of me, nothing but air. But I swear I felt something was in front of me. I didn't want to move forward. It was like an invisible wall had erected before me and while I couldn't see it, I knew that if I went any further, I'd get hurt. It just felt oppressive and strange. I actually backed up into the house and slid along the wall all the way to the front and whatever invisible force was there, I felt like it followed me. I actually began to cry because I felt like there was a person just pressing up against me as I moved, like they were trying to force me back. Once I hit the edge of the house, I ran. I ran to my car and sped away. I cried most of the way back because it was just so, I don't know what else to say, but terrifying. 
When I told Mrs. Nice about it next time I saw her, she said Tommy likes to do that. He tries to intimidate people. He does it to Mr. Nice all the time, apparently. Around the third week after the Nices left for their summer house, I passed the house and swore I saw someone standing at the mailbox. But it wasn't solid. It was like a blurred outline of a person when I got closer. As I passed, the head seemed to turn with me as I drove, watching me. I don't like passing the house. I'm glad they're back for the winter. It makes me feel a bit more at ease to know they're there, but I still don't like the idea of delivering packages to them. I do not want to be anywhere near Tommy. And of course, I saved the worst place for last. Number three, the Hills Have Eyes house. I hate this house. This is the one that isn't in the ghost town. This is in the section before it, the outskirters. These are the homes that are so scattered we usually won't bring parcels out for them because they're so far away. But this house is an exception because it's less than a mile from the cluster of boxes they get their mail at. These people are never home. Jim told me to never call them. They're apparently very rude and very hostile. He instructed me to just go to their gate. If they have a parcel, always bring the mail with it or they'll call and complain. Leave the parcel in the basket that hangs on their fence with their mail in a rubber band and leave. He said to never linger there. He told me that if I did, they'd get hostile. I do as I'm told, but thankfully they've almost never been home. But something is. I know that sounds so cheesy, but it's true. I don't know the history of the place itself, just that these people were apparently the world's biggest jerks. Two men live there, brothers from what Jim told me. They run a small chicken farm and bring their eggs to the feed store in town to sell all the time. It's not uncommon to see their chickens roaming around on the road leading up to the house. The road itself is barely a road, it's more like a bumpy little walking trail, but it's the only way to get there. And I know I've said it already, but God, I hate going there. I call it the Hills Have Eyes house because it's settled between two large hills, and from far away, the hills look like eyes and the house looks like a mouth. That, and the way this place looks, it looks like something out of the movie The Hills Have Eyes. There's butchering equipment everywhere. Bloody knives and cleavers and chains and hooks. They've got cows too, but I think they've kept the meat for themselves. The smell is just atrocious. It always smells like death. To be honest, it wouldn't shock me if these guys did some terrible things out there and only butchered cows when they did it to make excuses for the stench of death. Every single time I go out there, something happens. I've been out there six times to deliver parcels, so I will recount each incident. The first time was about three months after I started delivering. I did as I was told, wrapped the mail in a rubber band and headed out to the house. It takes a good three or four minutes. It's around a bend and that's when you see the other two hills that the house sits between. The main house has a fence around it with a gate but the whole property has an outer fence with no gate that I go through. Once you're up against the gate the whole place looks a lot smaller than it is because it's full of junk. All the butchering stuff random metal sculptures, a bunch of worn out furniture, garbage, a few cow skulls here and there, and then the house itself. The house is just a small trailer that's been cemented into the ground so it's no longer mobile. A makeshift ramp porch thing sits against the door and leads to a side gate. This is where the basket for packages is. All around this gated area are coops and other fenced areas for the animals. It's smelly and weird and creepy all around there. I just tossed the box and mail into the basket and turned to leave. I didn't want to stay at all. When I got into the car, I looked in my rearview mirror and swear I saw a man standing behind my car. But when I poked my head out to ask him to move, there was no one there. Of course, I didn't stay another second. The second incident was closer to the evening. It was another super heavy day and I did not want to go out there. As I was approaching, I saw something standing at the window of the house. I assumed it was one of them trying to see who was coming. 
I have car magnets on my car that all say USPS on them so people know who I am. I figured he'd see them and be more at ease knowing a package was coming and not some random weirdo. But as I approach, the figure in the window seemed to distort and eventually vanish entirely. I did not want to get out of the car. I just wanted to stay there and toss the parcel and mail out the window. After working up the courage, I sped from the car to the basket back and I went to leave. As I was getting into the car, I heard this loud, raucous laughter. It sounded like it was right next to my car, like someone was standing beside me and just bellowing laughter. I prayed I wouldn't have to come back for a while. Two months later, I had to go back with four big boxes for them. This time, it was a pretty light day. I was breezing through delivery pretty quickly, so I was happy about that. They're about in the middle of the route, so they're like a halfway point to me. I went to the house and was greeted by a large bull in the yard. I'm not usually nervous around animals, but a bull isn't something you want to mess around with. He was standing just a few feet away from the fence with a basket, so I just patiently waited to see if he'd move. I didn't want to honk, lest the angry idiot who lived there just happened to be home and come out to yell at me or something. I didn't want to shoo him because honestly, I didn't think it'd work. All of a sudden, this bull just moves and freaks out, thrashing about like someone was riding him. It came dangerously close to my car before running off into an area where the fences are. Then a whole chorus of moves erupted from that area, and it was just a cacophony of noise. I grabbed the boxes and got them to the fence as fast as I could. I didn't know what spooked the bull. I didn't care. I just wanted to leave. I didn't see anything this time, but I was afraid of the bull coming back and tearing up my car or even goring me in the process. The fourth incident is honestly not the worst, but still unsettling. I had never had packages so small that it fit in the box for them. Honestly, I almost said screw it and shoved it in the mailbox. I should have, but I didn't want them to call and complain. They hadn't on me thus far and I wanted to keep it that way, so I reluctantly headed to the house with a package in their mail. When I got there, a single dead chicken was hanging from the awning above the porch. Weird, but honestly it wasn't surprising. Not as surprising as the giant dressed cow hanging from the pole on the other side of the yard. I didn't notice that until I was putting the package in the basket. It's obscured by a tree when driving up to the place. As I'm walking back to the car, the chicken and the cow both start to suddenly swing. It's not windy, and even if it was, one of these things is a freaking cow. I don't think a light breeze is going to push a cow. They're swinging back and forth almost in tandem, and I just went, nope, and left. I wasn't going to stay for the rest of that show. The fifth time was two weeks ago. It had been quite a while since I went out there, and I had vainly hoped that I wouldn't have to go back for longer, but oh well. The holidays are starting. Everyone is getting stuff. I get out there with three boxes, and for the first time, I see a living, breathing person in the window. Jim told me one of the brothers was in a wheelchair. This was that brother. He was bald with a weird tribal tattoo across where I believe his hairline used to be, just sitting in the window staring at me. I waved out of curiosity and of course he didn't wave back. First time either of us had ever laid eyes on one another, but I don't know what I expected him to do, smile and wave back, when I knew well that these guys didn't have a happy bone in their body. I noticed as I put the parcels in the basket that he wasn't looking at me, but something behind me. I looked and I saw someone walking behind one of the chicken coops. I looked back at the brother in the window and he kind of gave me a grumpy sort of, you saw that right, kind of look, and nodded toward the coop. I just kind of slowly nodded and went back to the car. He watched me back out and as I was turning back onto the road, I saw him leave the window and draw the curtain closed. The last time was actually yesterday and thus far the freakiest thing next to the bowl. I was having a typical holiday season Monday, very heavy day with lots of mail and lots of parcels, and of course they had to have a whopping five parcels. I get out there at about 4pm or so and I'm already exhausted, halfway done, 
knowing I'm not going to be home until about 7. It takes a good 45 minutes to get back to the post office and another 10 to unload and finish my day. I know I won't finish the route until about 6 or so, so I'm just trying to hurry. Going out to this place doesn't help in making good time, so I get out there, get out, put some of the boxes in the basket and the others below it and go to leave. Suddenly I feel a hard tug on my shirt that pulls me back and I fall on my butt in the dirt. I hit my head on the edge of the trailer and swear to myself before getting up. I thought I maybe just caught my shirt on something but as I get further away, I feel another hard tug and I fall back again. This time, I know I didn't catch on anything because I was about two feet from the fence on my left and there was nothing on my right and nothing directly behind me. I scramble up and try to run and I pull hard as I feel another tug and I hear that god awful laugh again. I didn't look back, I left. I still talk to Jim every now and then and when I tell him about those incidents he goes, oh yeah. That place is haunted, more so than some of the others, I think. In Jim's opinion, the whole route is cursed. There are, as I said, other places out there where weird stuff happens, but these are the ones that I find the freakiest. After yesterday's little incident at the Hills Have Eyes house, I felt like I wanted to share these stories with someone other than my husband. Either way, I'm in a contract now, so if this is the best of the last seven months... I'm sure I'll have way more after these 10 years are over. The following story took place while I attended an all-male military boarding school in 2004. At age 14, my parents sent me to a military school in Virginia for bad behavior. Cadets stayed at the school throughout the school year except for a few weekends and holiday leaves. The school opened in 1898. Many buildings on the campus have been around for over a hundred years like the barracks I slept in, though several buildings throughout the years have burned down, like once such occurrence when an accidental fire burnt down the Delta Company barracks in 1924. The academic building was built around 1915. It was two stories tall with the second floor being full of classrooms, but my experience took place on the first floor which featured a handful of offices for facility officers, a computer lab, and a large room that had two large swinging doors that opened into a study hall meant to accommodate roughly 75 students at any given time. One aspect of my new life as a cadet was called guard duty. Every day, three cadets were randomly selected to be on guard duty, guards had to wake up an hour earlier than everyone else at 5 a.m. You'd wake up, get dressed in uniform, and meet the other two guards at the academic hall. Once the guards got to the building, they were supposed to do a walkthrough on both floors to make sure nothing was out of place and check that nobody was inside. After the walkthrough, you'd sit by the phone in the first floor hallway and take calls for anyone happening to call in. I had been at the boarding school for a few months when I was assigned to my first guard duty. The next morning I woke up early and got dressed as quietly as possible to avoid waking my roommate. It was pouring outside so I put my rain jacket on on top of my uniform and walked through the dark to the academic building. Usually guards would meet up outside the building but since it was raining hard I decided to go inside by myself. I waited inside the dark building for the other guards to show up. After about 10 minutes, I started to get worried because they still had not shown up and I was concerned that a facility officer might come early and see that I had not done my job. So I walked up the stairs and checked every classroom and the creepy bathroom that looked like it hadn't been updated since the 1940s. Nothing was out of place, so I made my way downstairs to check the offices, study hall, and other rooms. I thoroughly opened every door and walked through every room. Once again, nothing was out of place and no one was inside. Everything seemed in good order in the dark building, so I sat down in the hallway next to the phone. After a few minutes, I felt the weirdest sensation. The building had begun to shake softly. I could feel the vibrations in my body and see the small table next to me shake ever so much. I sat there completely frightened by whatever was occurring in front of my eyes. The rumbling abruptly stopped a few moments later and I took a big sigh of relief. 
but then I started hearing noises from the study hall room, the doors to which were only ten feet away from me. It started off barely legible and I couldn't tell what I was hearing from the room, though it seemed like it was getting louder and soon I started to hear what sounded like whispering. It kept getting louder and louder until I could hear what sounded like dozens and dozens of voices inside the room. After a few moments, I could hear what they were saying, but it was as if many conversations were taking place all at once in a chaotic sense. I could hear laughter and comments like, Pass me the answer to the math homework. This was a room that I'd just been in a short while ago, and there was no other entrance into it other than the swinging doors I was sitting near. It had been completely empty short of all the desks and other items throughout the room, but now I was hearing what I can only describe as a room full of voices. I sat there paralyzed with fear while hearing all of this. Then I began to also hear a tapping noise coming from the room. It sounded almost as if though someone was hitting a ruler against the desk. The tapping sound began to move around the room while all the other voices continued. Suddenly the tapping stopped. But what was so much worse, I heard something scream. Sit down and shut up, it's study time. It was incredibly loud and unmistakable like an instructor was in there screaming at a room full of cadets. As soon as whomever or whatever finished screaming, the study hall felt completely silent. I sat in my chair wanting to bolt out of the building, but I was too scared to move. Plus, I'd have to pass by the doorway to the study hall to get out of the building. My heart was pounding in my chest and I was breathing incredibly hard. I was terrified that whatever was in that room would realize that I was there. Then the building softly began to shake again, almost as if whatever was taking place was coming to an end. A few minutes passed as I sat there in my chair in silence. I couldn't hear anything anymore coming from the study hall and I began to feel slightly better about circumstances, though I still had not built up the nerves to make a run for it. But then the building started to shake again, and I could hear the ruler tapping noise starting up again in the room. This time it was clear that it was making its way to the door that led to me. It was moving fast and growing louder. It had almost gotten to the swinging doors. I sprang up. Without thinking, my survival instincts kicked in and I sprinted out of the building as fast as I've ever run before. Now outside, I made my way through the dark back to my barracks just as I was getting near the barracks, one of the guards was sleepily walking out of the barracks. The other students were all still fast asleep. I calmed my nerves and walked up to him. He hadn't seen me running in the rain and for some reason I didn't tell him what I had experienced. I walked with him back to the academic building as he explained how he had overslept. We walked inside and he made a beeline to the study hall room, opened the swinging doors, walked in and tossed his backpack onto his assigned desk. I followed him inside, apprehensively. The room was still empty. I'll start off by saying no, this isn't my story, but it was such a crazy encounter that I have since asked each of my friends through the years to recount the events. This happened around the year 2000. About a year after this took place, I started dating one of these friends, and that's when I first heard about this dog-wolf story. I have since asked each friend over the years and miles apart, and they all remember the same encounter. Before my ex was even my boyfriend, let's call him Jay, he and our other friends were about 17 to 18 years old. At that age, I remember it being an adventure to find a place to smoke. Let's hike to X and Puff. Uh, the good old days, when we got away from parents and planned a day around smoking. It was Jay and his best friend B and their girlfriends S and M. The four of them decided to drive to Mount Pisgah, a beautiful wooded area outside of Eugene, Oregon. It's more of a hill, but it's nature in its prime for sure. I've been out there many times growing up and I know exactly what trail they were on. The main one that connects the parking lot to the river. They had driven in B's little white sedan, parked in the parking lot, and then walked to the river. On the way to the river from the lot, there is a very small bridge that crosses a small creek. The group spent the day out there, swimming and puffing, puffing and swimming, just being typical Oregonian teens. 
I could imagine that hunger is what drove them to go home after a few hours as the sun began to set. Either activity alone is bound to get someone hungry, let alone both. So they walked along the well-worn main dirt path to the parking lot. This path has since been paved, according to Google Maps. It doesn't take but 20 minutes or so for them to get back to the little footbridge by the parking lot that they had crossed when they hiked in. When they reached the small footbridge near the parking lot, B looked out into the vast field between them and the wooded mountain and noticed a huge dog near the tree line, about a hundred yards away. They all later described it as the biggest dog they'd ever seen. The dog was just sitting there, not looking scary, just looking like a humongous friendly dog. It was starting to get dark, but M and J's descriptions and the drawing she did for me later in 2005, it was very shaggy and furry. I may even still have that notebook where she drew the dog thing, I'll have to find it and post it. My friends continued to walk across this small wooden bridge and one of the girls screamed. The big dog was now on its hind legs, standing much closer than when they had seen it just a couple of seconds earlier. It had traversed most of the large field in the seconds it took them to get across this ten foot long bridge. Whatever this thing was, it was fast, quiet and stealthy. My four friends ran to the car and they had the classic cliché I can't get the key in because B was fumbling madly for the keys. At this point the dog was standing on its legs at the very edge of the parking lot looking at them. Still had the dog face, still had the dog body standing up. They never saw it walking on all four or just two. It was like every time they looked up it was just standing there closer. As Jay had said, every time they looked up, he was closer but not moving. All of them recounted how surreal it was to see a dog standing on its hind legs. I don't know if it ran for a few ticks and then stood up again at intervals in the field, but that's the way they described it. Many times I asked them, are you sure it wasn't a bear? No, it definitely was a dog standing on its hind legs, a big dog that was stalking them. This is in Lane County, Oregon in the year 2000. There are few, if any, bears out there. It would be odd, but then again, I wasn't there. The kids got into the car and sped off, leaving this beast to its own business. I've never had a reason to doubt any of their stories. In fact, S doesn't like to talk about the incident at all because it was too terrifying for her to recall. I've been hesitant on posting any story mainly due to the fact that I don't want anyone ever thinking that I or the person the story is about is crazy. Although saying this actually happened sounds very cliche but I can assure you the following stories are true. Now before I begin the story just for a bit of background, I am an intern for a church that does work on a Navajo reservation site helping the community on people's homes like roofing repair, repainting and interior fixing. 8 to 5, with good pay and nice people, so overall I'm pretty happy with this. And as a bit of a disclaimer, I'm not trying to offend Navajo tradition in any way. This is just a first-hand story on what is currently happening on my trip. Over the past two months of this internship, I had begun to grow fairly close with some of the residents on the reservation. One lady in particular that I got to know pretty well was the superstitious type. Like said, never be outside at night or other random seeming things to me like that, but the biggest taboo I knew to never mention, mainly because I was told by my superiors, was Navajo folklore like skinwalkers. However, one day it was very different in the sense that the question was just burning within me. I was on my lunch break after wrapping up painting parts of her house, and she sits next to me on her porch and we talk for a while but I finally feel comfortable enough to ask her about any folklore about werewolves or anything of that sorts. I didn't really expect a response. I thought maybe she'd quickly say no then change the topic, but if anything I was more scared I may offend her. But to my surprise she turns her head looking toward the outside scenery, hesitates but then says, Yes, I know some and I've experienced some too. She proceeded to tell me a description on the apparent equivalent to a werewolf. 
To paraphrase, she said, Werewolves look like normal people, but masked in white paint, covering their face, arms, and chest. Their whole body as white as a corpse, covered with black symbols, quite possibly related to devil worshipping. More specifically, they are grave diggers and necromancers as well. They dig up bodies only to steal jewelry, although they may perform other acts to corpses as she quickly stayed away from going into too much detail about that part. Werewolves also get their power from the devil. That is how they are able to possess such supernatural strength and endurance. I was surprised to hear this, although I figured werewolves wouldn't look anything like that in Twilight or Scooby-Doo, although deep down, even though she sounded a bit crazy. Before I could ask more questions about these werewolves, she began to tell me her own interaction with these supernatural beasts, and her story still gives me chills. She explained that one day her and her husband were driving on the curvy roads alongside the mountains, only to find a woman with her face covered by her hands and was kneeling in the middle of the road, appearing as though she was crying. The woman looks up towards the car's headlights to reveal the very same white paint and sacrificial symbols mentioned previously. Her husband honked his horn and quickly slams on the brakes only to be too late and hears the loud cracking sound of the woman's bones and the splash of blood all over the windshield. Once her and her husband stop the car safely and process what had just happened, they quickly run over to the spot where they hit the woman. However, once they reached the spot, there was no body, but not only that, there was no trace of blood either. Now, just as a side note, this part of the reservation has some cliffs, but it was relatively flat land, so it would be obvious to tell where someone is, especially if they got hit by a car. Puzzled by what the possible explanation could be for this occurrence, her and her husband drove back home trying to neglect the thought that they had just witnessed a werewolf. However, being the non-paranormal believers they were at the time, they tried to just close this occurrence off as them just losing their minds. As interesting as her story was, this got me thinking. Is it possible for this werewolf story to be true? Or is this her own way of describing a skinwalker or other supernatural phenomenon because she didn't think I knew what a skinwalker was? This question kept circling through my head. So as you could expect, the following nights made it harder for me to sleep comfortably. And because of that, during the work days, I would feel more and more mentally drained, almost paranoid. At the end of the week, around six, I was sitting in the car, driving back to the church site, and was in the mental state of mind where I was half awake and half asleep. My buddy was driving and claimed that he wanted to pull over at the gas station that was near the church to grab a couple of snacks to munch on during our debrief time in our cabin. Since I was too tired to argue, I said fine and laid my face against the window and tried to doze off while waiting for my friend. However, I had the weirdest feeling that I was being watched, so naturally I opened my eyes and looked out the window. I saw nothing. However, when I turned my head out of the corner of my eye, I thought I saw a white figure, just as the woman described previously. I looked back and saw nothing was there, but I swear I saw something. Since it was beginning to get dark outside, I quickly sat up in my seat to readjust my vision, but when I looked back out the window, it was almost as though the figure had vanished. Perplexed, I stepped outside the car and looked around, but there was no trace of a creature even existing. My buddy comes back to the car and questions what the heck I was doing. Debating on whether or not I should tell him, I decided to just say, oh, I'm just getting some fresh air. Let's head out. The following days have been even worse for me. My mood is getting worse. I'm feeling way more paranoid that something is out there. And at night I can almost swear that I hear screams in the far distance. Everything outside just looks a hundred times scarier too because... There is barely any outside light besides the moonlight, so everything is more of an exaggerated appearance. But believe me, I know I sound crazy. But the worst part is that if I tell anyone, they'll think I'm crazy too. So I have been debating whether or not I actually saw the werewolf that the lady described, or if it was just my tired eyes playing tricks on me. I hope someone can find some sort of answer to this werewolf mystery. Also, if you have any similar paranormal stories like this, please share. 
I'm trying my best to become more aware about the paranormal. If I find anything, I'll give my future updates about any more encounters or odd discoveries. It all started a couple of months ago after we moved into our new house. To get some more details in, I live with my stepfather, my little brother, and our dog Cosmo. We moved into an old house that is on a little gravel road with three other houses. There was a road on one side of the house and miles of wood on the other side. When I say it was an old house, I mean it was old from the 1800s and you can hear when someone walks around or opens a door. I can't remember the exact date, but I can remember the time it was 2 a.m. I was up watching anime, I was home alone with my little brother and my dog, and they were sleeping upstairs and they hadn't moved, and if they had, I could have heard it. Suddenly I go to the bathroom and I was going towards my door when I hear someone running in the living room on the other side of the door. It shocked me, so I stopped, and I tried not to react or scream as it kept going back and forth. I say it because it didn't run normally. It sounded like someone was running on all fours, but it still was weird. It kept going for hours, day in and day out for weeks, and I felt like it wouldn't stop, but one night was different. I couldn't hear it running around at all, there were no sounds coming from the living room. It took me all my energy to go into the living room, and when I did, I heard the running again, but this time it came right for me, and stopped right in front of me. I froze. I have been really sensitive about the paranormal, and I have tried some things, but I have a way of feeling them, and that's with my feet. If someone was on the same floor as me, I can feel their feet. I know it sounds strange, but with this thing, I could feel its feet and hands on the floor right in front of me, because I froze. And this time, I could feel its eyes, and that has never happened to me before. After I felt its eyes gazing into me, I passed out. That was in 2016, and I still hear feel and see it. Along the years I have gotten used to it and I have seen it a lot of times. It's hard to describe but I'll try. It's in a permanent bridge like the move that a girl learns in gym class but his feet and hands are turned towards me and his head is turned to the side and he doesn't have a jaw. I get this weird chill every time he is close. He's all black like a shadow. Yes, I've said him instead of it, but that's because that's what he feels like, a male presence. I have lived with him for a long time now, and I'm the only one that can see or feel him. I even had a clairvoyant to come and see if she could help me, but she couldn't feel him either. He doesn't do anything else other than running around on the other side of my door, always in the room that is beside my door, which is always the living room. I'm not scared of him. He doesn't say anything and he only attacks me in my dreams. The only thing that he does while I'm awake is that every time he is close to me I just want to scream and feel like I'm about to shake. I don't know what he is or what he wants, but he will not leave me alone. If anyone can say what he is, then please tell me so I can see if I can get some peace. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r let's read official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends, and I'll see you again soon.